right, there you go. So I can understand it. Here, go, Haley. Here's the view. Thank you. Um, there's chat. Great. Is this recording? Yes. Not very. Thank you. Oh, it's because the whole thing is <laughs> just appeared to be narrow. Yes, there it is. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Delta Charlie's. Hope you had a nice weekend. Uh, I think I was quite impressed with test number two. Uh, I think that you put a lot of effort and work into preparing yourselves, and I think it paid off. Let's take a look at our baby schedule here. Um, we are here on week number 10. So we are, we are one week behind, uh, unfortunately. Hello. Let me grab your test here, uh, Maddie. Maddie. Uh, so we had to, I'm proposing that we push this day, Tuesday, I propose that we push Thursday into today, so we're going to have to squeeze uh, statistical study design into Thursday, uh, so Thursday is going to be a beefy day, uh, we're probably going to have to do a little extra work on Thursday, um, I think, I thought, I made the assessment that actually giving our experimental data its due time is probably best in the long run for your understanding. Instead of chopping the head off our experiments, uh, I, I wanted to run that all the way through. So our goal today is to make sure that you feel prepared for the completion of the homework seven, which is due uh, Thursday at midnight. So our plan today is to pick up the Thursday content, which is understanding with uh, an even higher level of detail how we can use the breakdown of the normal curve to make inferences about if I have an observation that falls here on our normal distribution, what we want to be able to do today is say, using a fancy table, what percent of values would we expect an observation that falls here to be above or below? And to do that, we're going to use what sometimes seems a little bit overwhelming is the normal distribution scale table, uh, but we want to make friends with this table because we didn't make friends with it on Thursday. Um, so if you leave here today being able to convert this table into an actual sentence about the way that a variable works or the, uh, how an observation relates to the others, I think you'll be in good shape. So um, that's my proposed plan. And to do that, we're going to get a chance to analyze uh, data from test number two. So on the top of today's packet is the distribution. And on the right-hand side are the raw scores. So when possible, I like to use actual data. And this is about as actual as it comes, since this is data about adults. Um, so let's take a look at where on the top of your test, you'll see a number has been written. That number is not a percent. That number is a raw score of points that I was able to grant based on the scoring key. So except for one of you whose test got stuck in a folder, everyone's number should be somewhere down this line. And you should have a location somewhere in this distribution. Um, so let's take a look at how it all fell down. Um, so our median score came out to 76. 
with a interquartile range of from 61 to 81, so about 20 points. What does this mean, interquartile range of 20 points? Nate? Q3 minus Q1. And what does that mean in terms of um, what chunk of data does that bound? The middle 15%. Yeah, the middle half. So we'd say that um, if I drew people on av or randomly from classes, every other person I draw should have a score between 61 and 81. I'm trying to use language to help our brains, which is that we can think of a distribution as both a raw picture of how the scores fell out, but if I interpret it as if I kept giving this test to thousands upon thousands upon thousands of students, and I have the same distribution, I can think about it probabilistically. What's the chance of someone getting a score between 61 and 81? Um, well, about half, if the data are normally distributed. So we're going to take a look at some of this. So um, based on what we did last test, I'm going to invite you to work alone or with people around you to tackle uh, question number one. Can someone read question one? Using our same strategies, test number one, to arrive at a whole value for grading purposes, use the summary statistics at left to propose a fair total point value for test number two for Eric to enter into the grade book. All right, this is your big chance. So what percent did you get? Well, this is your chance to figure out what would be fair. Uh, what was our approach we used last time? We said, let's take the median and make it what? I think we said median is 80. That's what we did. Vision, I was thinking yes. So, we want, if, we, if you want to propose that again, we could say the median score should translate to an 80%. So this is what we want to align to. And what's our basic relationship for percent? Sam? Yeah, so we've got part is your score. We want to determine what the whole should be, so this is our unknown, and we multiply by 100% to do the conversion. So take a moment and see if you can arrive at a whole given this. And then you can keep going, question two and three, uh, which will be kind of interesting. So let's, uh, let's crunch some numbers. Does anyone need a calculator? I got a bunch of nice calculators. Feel free to collaborate with brains around you. So I might take a next step and say something like, uh, Good 
you're, you're a head worker. That's not 100 percent, even though he got over 100 percent. So then it wouldn't be fair for the people who got it on the lower end, and the people who are actually in the like the meat. Look at the 69. The part is the median, so we want to say, if you got the median score, how would you, what, what would be your out of to get 80%? So this is the theoretical median student. Over some holes, it should get you 80%. You don't know? Yeah. It's either yes or no, not? Yeah, yeah. So okay. the median score gets 80%. Okay. Which is exactly what you're asking. Oh, oh, we can take the message. You're getting this a little bit of a slide by your money. And you got to get it. Okay. Nomination? That doesn't work. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. I don't know, I think it should be out of the eight. You came up with a uh, total possible yeah, Nominations? Don't use this. You what? 95. That's basically that. Yeah. So this is this is interesting. We've got a different experience than we did on test one. So uh, what's what's a nomination? 86, what does the math say to make the median 80%? I know I saw Nate had it, I think Avery, did you have it? I don't know. So what was the median score? 76, so 76 over what gives us 0 0.80? 95. 95, over 95. So let's check it. Does that, in fact, equal 80%? 76 over 95. So what does that mean about our performance on the test? 
if we don't adjust and we use the actual possible, did the median score get over or less than 80? What, did anyone compute the total possible? Fran, you did. Hmm? What was the total possible on the test? Um, 86. Did anyone else calculate it? Any, any seconds on that? Yeah. Did you get 86 too? Yeah. And that's not including bonus, right? No. So what does that mean? It means our median, if we use the possible, the median of 76 over 86, in fact, is what? An 88. Yeah. So the overall performance on this test was significantly higher than test one, partly because the test was shorter and I didn't have a bunch of extra questions. Um, so we, I think this was very positive. So I would propose that we don't adjust the bottom. Okay. That if we use an 86, the median is in fact higher than the median on the last test was. So a 76 over 86 would give the median score an 88. Good work. That's nice stuff. So we use, uh, we can go with 86. Um, now, we're, this is all in realm of what we're working on in class. Let's take a look at question two. Um, describe the shape of test two data using the visual appearance of the histogram and our summary stats. So our rule, what's, our, what's the fancy rule we're trying to get to know really well? If the data are normally distributed, we'd expect 1% to fall within plus or minus one standard deviation. 68. Would you expect what percent to fall within plus or minus 2? 95. Yep. 95 plus minus 2. And what's the last? 99.7. Basically all to fall plus or minus 3 standard deviations. This rule only holds if the data are what? The assumption is it must pass what test? This rule is based on the shape of this curve. So if the data don't look like this, should we apply this rule? No, if the data looked like this, it wouldn't follow that same rule. So when we take a look at a histogram, before we get rambunctious and start doing a bunch of stats, we have to ask the question, is the data roughly mound shaped? And what's the other piece? What are the two centers that we want? The mean and mean. Should be about what? On top of each other. Yeah, thanks Haley. So let's, let's uh, pass that, let's uh, run this test on our test data. Describe the shape of the test data. Well, first of all, when you just look at it with your eyes, does it look like a mound? No. I see some shaking. Mound-like, Rachel? Roberta? We have, yeah, we have mound, I would say that we have some moundness. But we have, you used the right word. Skewed to the left. Skewed to the left, because our we have this left tail. So we should be worried about applying this rule to skewed data. So on question number two, we could say, I see a left tail, which suggests left skewness. And we should be able to see that appear by comparing our mean and our median. So we could say, let's get that data down here. So our mean was 69.2. Our median was 76.0. So that's a difference of How far apart were they? Were they on top of each other? No. Haley? Oh. No. Nope. How far apart were they? It 
six point eight. Six point eight points off. Six point eight points different. So we could make we could make a big exclamation point. So this is skewness alert. Skewness alert. Our mean and median were not on top of each other. Um, now, this is not quite a statistics class, but it's masquerading as a statistics class. And uh, in the real world, most data are skewed. And statisticians love the normal distribution so much. It does so much for us that if there's any possible way we can get away with applying the principles of the normal distribution, even if the data don't fit exactly, statisticians often do. So I want to just try. Let's see how close it gets. If we assume normality, meaning we can use our fancy rule, let's do this table again. We've done this once before with our actual data, and let's see if we can do it nice and quick for our test data, because it's really good for your brain. So you have the actual values here, so we want to see how close did even skewed data come to passing the rule, or to passing as roughly normal? So we, I made this table because I think it's helpful for my brain, and maybe it's helpful for yours. So let's, let's try it again, doing just like we did for your, um, your sample data. So let's start with our middle. So we have our mean of 69.2. And then we have our standard deviation, 16.62. So let's get our chop points. How do we get our chop points? Our fence, I guess fences is a better word. How do we get our fences? We just add our standard deviation. So we, we take standard deviation steps from the mean above and below. We're just going up and down by one standard deviation. So 69.2 plus our standard deviation of 16.62. So we're doing the same pattern. We want this pattern to feel repetitive. Once it starts feeling repetitive, then we're in good brain shape. So plus 1 would be 85.82. So interesting. Basically almost at the top of our of our possible points. Um, so do that again, 16.62. Do we need to keep going up to the third? There were not that many bonus points, but we can do it for fun. Okay, try the downward trend on your own, and then see if you can actually compute it using the raw data. So our, we had an N of 45, so we want to figure out how many scores fell within plus or minus 1 divided by 45 times 100%. Then we want to see how close did it get to 68, how close did this one get to 95, and how close did this get to 99.7. So we're practicing what we did last Thursday on real data. Darso, yes? I think you have the wrong standard deviations because 69.2 uh, plus 16.2 is 85.4. Uh, can I copy it down, wrong? No. Nice having extra brains. Plus 16.62. Oh, I thought it said 2. No, no. Sorry. No. Feel free to work with people around you. It's not a test. Okay, you got your cut Okay. So then you'll need to use your raw data to see how close you get. Now we want to see how, how many scores fell 
between plus and minus one. So count up easier than raw scores. So the rule says 68% are supposed to be between this and this. Let's see how many percent actually are by counting the number divided by plus five. So that's the actual in the sixty eight was expected. Yes. So how close was it to normal? We could do like a little reverse there. We, the rule would have expected exactly sixty eight. You computed seventy five. So that's the that's the interesting comparison. A truly normal curve, truly normal distribution would be right. Can you figure out the actual so you can have a okay. how many values are going for? In this case, you're actually looking at the raw data. How many scores fell between the yeah, two and the two? And we want to compute that as a So your rule says 68% of these should be between that and that. Now you want to count how many actually are. Well, I mean, the rounding where I just affect the number. So what were your fences, meaning what were your, what was your first standard deviation cutoff? What was the minus one? 52.50. 52.50, what, sorry? 5.8. Five 5.8, eight. Five eight. so I would think of these as little fences. So which numbers are going to fall in that fence? Well, 52 falls out of it, so this is our first, this is minus one S there all the way through 85. 
So all of our 85s are plus 1s. So how many is that? Well, it's 45 minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So that's 34. Anyone corroborate that? Yes. Yeah. And what did that come out to be? 34 over 45? 75%. So how normal was it? 75% versus... 68. It was a big difference. Yeah, this is this is where this is where it it depends on what we're trying to do with the numbers. They're not on top of each other. Are they different enough to mean that it's not normal? Well, it turns out this I would I would suggest is big enough to say it's not quite normal. What was it? 78. Sorry. 75, sorry, whited it out and then I didn't remember. Um, so yeah, not, not quite normal. And then what percent fell plus or minus two? Is that ev almost everybody? 35.96. Uh, that was here? Yeah. Great, so then our cutoff would be, this became minus two S and then our my plus 2s was way down here. So what percent that was 40, 42? Yeah. 42 or 45 gave us? Oh, so that got a little bit closer. 93 versus 95. And then uh, I can make the deduction that uh, we should have everybody else, right? What was minus 3? Oh, my typo. Great, thanks. So that should be 45 over 45. So 100% fell. So we don't have any big outliers. That, that passes the test. Um, but this not being quite mound-like in the middle means that we're, we're kind of skewed. Um, for your information, statistically, if you're running a statistical package, you would say this is okay. This is not a big enough tail. Uh, to not do statistics, but in our case, I want you to realize that this tail is significant tail. Okay. Good. Questions on that? That's our basic pattern. We're going to do this uh, quite a bit. Um, okay, last two questions are going to bridge us to our big fancy table. Are you ready? Can someone read question four? Ready? Can you read? What's our basic formula? Observe minus mean over standard deviation. It got said very quietly in the front. Thank you, Kenny. Observe minus mean over our most important standard deviation. Because that's what a z-score is. How many standard deviations are you? And using our rule, a z-score over 3 or under 3 is considered... What? An outlier, extreme. So let's take a look at 75. So um, what would 75 be? 75 points minus the center of our distribution. Our mean of 69.2. I can do that. 75 minus 69.2 over 16 point something. 16.620. It's not a percent, so we're not multiplying by 100. We're dividing by the standard deviation to compute a number of standard deviations. So we can plot that out. I'm going to use parentheses on my calculator. Quite important if you're uh, calculating type. You want to put everything in. Because I don't want these to divide first. I need to do the subtraction and then divide by my standard deviation. I put those in. I'll round to three decimal places. So, how would you describe the score of 75? Pulse within it. 
Within what? The st uh, standard deviations from three, one to three. Definitely within one to three. It even falls within uh, one to one. So we'd say this score is right in the middle of the pack. This is a middle of the pack score. Middle of pack. This would be not too far from the middle. Um, now, this is interesting. So this is our bridge on question five. Um, Fran, could you read question five? Yeah. Thanks. Using the standard normal table. Oh, stop. Oh. Using the what? <laughs> Did you read it again? No, you didn't read it great. But it's so important, I wanted you to read it again. The standard normal table. The standard normal table. This is a really important table. That's this. Grab this. Using the standard normal table. This table was computed using calculus and fancy computers. You don't have to know how to use the computers or the calculus, but you have to know how to use the table. So thank you, friend. You're, you're doing great. Try it one more time. Okay. Using the standard normal table, what percentile would this score of 75 have been? Interpret what this percentile means in a sentence. Ah, that was, that was beautiful. So first of all, let's define... Uh, percentile and if you have your homework out we're gonna do some of our definitions together so on the front page of your homework I have some definitions here um, percentile is the percent of observations equal to or below a given value so if I ask you what is the percentile of a given score what I want to know is how many or what percent of total observations, I could even uh, amend this a little bit. I'm going to, this is really ugly writing. The percent, and I write it. Knowing me, it'll be just about as ugly. So, the percent of total observations. that are equal to or below a value, I'll say a value of interest. In our case, it's a value of a score of 75. So if we go back to, I'm going to keep that up there and then put question 5 under it. So question five is saying, what percent of our STQ 101 students in this section and the next section would we expect under a normal distribution to be at or below a score of 75? And this table is going to help us do that. And this table is going to bridge us into the key idea. Um, so we're going to assume normality. So we're going to draw our little, our little picture. So let's draw a picture. What are we interested in? We're going to assume a roughly normal curve. And let's label our mean. I should have left some room underneath. I'm going to do it over on the right. Uh, it's OK. So for each one of these questions, from now until the end of time, probably, we're going to draw a little curve. You're going to get good at making normal curves. We put our mean in there. Our mean for the test was 69.2, also known as X bar. 69.2. We're interested in the score of 75. Now, what's the Z score of the mean? What's the Z score of the mean? Nate? Zero. How'd you get that? Zero minus mean would be zero over the standard deviation. Yeah, so we'd be taking 69.2 minus 69.2 divided by 16.6. .6. So the Z score of the mean is zero. So make note on that Z score equals zero. You could also have realized that from looking at your fancy table or your fancy distribution, which is this guy. A mean is the center of our distribution. Now, we're interested in a score of 75, which is 
0.349 standard deviations above the mean. You have to draw your picture. Please draw the picture every time. So here's our score of interest. This is a score of 75 or a Z score of 0 0.349. Got to have your picture or we won't know how to use the table correctly. So here, when we say the percentile, what we're asking is what percent of observations are at this score or below, anything below. So percentile is asking, percentile is how many are here or less. Percentile is how many are here or less. And you have to trust me on this or take calculus. The way we can think about it is what's the area? Because the area of the entire normal curve, standard normal curve is 1, the full area is 1, so let's make a little note down here. Remember, is my camera still flashing red? It says it's recording. Okay, great. I just want to make sure because this is really important. So remember that total area under the whole curve is 1. Remember, area under whole curve is 1.0. So I want to know how much area is to the left of a z-score of 0 0.349. That's what the table is going to tell us. Um, let's also remember one more thing. Uh, how much area is to the left of the mean if it's a perfectly normal distribution. Also, remember, if this is our mean, what percent is to the left of the mean of a perfectly normal curve? If it's a perfectly symmetrical curve and the mean is the center, how many, what percent is to the left? Anastasia, idea? 50. 50. You had it in your head the whole time. I'm glad I called it in because you knew it. So half is below, half is above. So this is important because we need to sanity check our answers always. We know that the percentile or the area under the curve to the left of 0.349 is going to be at least what? Because 0.349 is positive, we know it's going to be at least what percent given that the mean is 50. It's going to be at least 50. It's going to be some chunk more than 50 because it's above the mean. So now we get our fancy table. The table, to, the way you look at the table is you are looking up a z-score on the outside edges of the table. I'm going to take it out of this thing so it's not so reflective. Um, and I'm, I want to draw your attention to the fact that the table is designed to give you a very precise reading. But if all you want to do is use a z-score of one decimal point, you really only need to worry about this first column. All the other columns are allowing you to do a more precise negative 3.60 negative 3.61. So what you're doing is you're looking up the z-score and the value that you arrive at in the table corresponds to the area under the curve to the left of that z-score. It's always to the left. If you see a table that's area to the right, you go, ah, that's a weird table. They're always to the left. The other side is scores above a z-score 
of zero. So what's important is, look here, we just answered our question. What percent of the curve is to the left of a z-score of zero? 50, that's the mean. The center is exactly half of the curve. So you're orienting yourself to this table. Don't get overwhelmed by how many numbers there are. The principle is very simple. As you move farther to the right, you should be accumulating area. And if you imagine a z-score that's super duper high, like a gazillion, we should have basically everything, 0.999. The highest z-score that this table can work with is, is 3.6, and then pull your hundredths from the column. This is a z-score of 3.69. Make a note on your table for your brain. So at a z-score of 3.69 is basically everything under the curve, okay? This is really, really clever. So now our goal is to look up a uh, score of 75. So a score of 75, notice that this table is designed to work with z-scores because we don't care what the actual number is, we just care about the z-score and whether or not the data are normal. If they're normal, we can use the table. If they're not, the table's useless. So we have to make the assumption of normality. So 0.349, here's the big moment. So 0.3 is here. We're going to round to the hundredth. So we're going to round the 4 to a 5. five. So we want to look up 0.35. Oh, look at this. According to the fancy math, a score of 75 should be equal to or higher than 0.6368, or in other words, 63.68% of all other scores. That's the number we've been looking for our whole lives, maybe. Mm -hmm. 0.6368. .3, so here's your, uh, here's your picture for number five. And so we would say um, the area. So remember, area is basically the same as percentile. So don't be confused. A percentile table is the area under the curve. Area under curve to the left is the same as asking for a percentile. And a z-score of... 0. Point, I'm going to write my actual table lookup, 0. 0.35 um, contains, or uh, what's the right way to say it, uh, has 60, has 0. 0.6368 of total area to its left. Or, sorry, I'm, I'm getting a little bit, uh, I ran out of space. Or in other words, or 0 0.6368 times 100% gives us a percentile. Percentiles are the percent version of the area under the curve. 63.68% of all values are equal to, less than or equal to 75. Oh, this is cool stuff. My picture has helped my brain because if I have a picture that's only grabbing, I should never have a value over five. So sometimes questions are going to ask you for this. How would I convert? What percent of scores, if we imagine giving the same test to a thousand students that are just like you, what percent of students would we expect to have a score higher than 75? 
How do we compute that? McKenna, mm -hmm. ideas? Mm -hmm. It relies on the fact that the total area is 1. Well, if it was higher, then like the middle one would just be 50% again. Well, it would be, it's higher than the middle, but it's not exactly the middle. So if this area is 63.68 and the whole area is 1, what is the area to the right? Oh. Would be 1 minus 0. 0.6368. Um, so that we'll, we'll get to those questions in a second. So, yep, yeah, so we could do that in our calculator. So you have to read the questions really carefully because sometimes they're going to ask you for the value greater than or equal to. Look, I did the wrong math. Minus. We'd say that this score, 36.32% of people sh we'd expect to score high. The 1 came from the fact that the total area under the curve is 1. Now, so if a question asks you for a va what percent are higher than a given value, you have to do the less than and then convert it on the last step because the table is only going to give you values to the left. Okay, can we practice? Roberta's giving me this look like I don't know about I don't know about these tail areas. Um, okay, so uh, this is the same data that you used on your test, except instead of using uh, what did you have on your test? I think you had health diagnosing, treating, and and health diagnosis and treating practitioners or other technical occupations. Uh, the other side of your test was life, physical, and social science occupations. And I gave you, uh, there's another set of occupations called material moving occupations. I think these are like forklift drivers. Um, I'm not sure if truck drivers fall under here. I think that, I think shipping is a separate one in the U.S. Census. Um, I really like forklifts and hydraulics, so I thought this would be quite interesting. Um, so we're going to do the same kind of set of questions using material movers. So here's the distribution, and here's your summary stats. And you may find it useful to cannibalize your packet. I'm going to cannibalize my packet uh, so that you can see the data. Uh, and try. Do you want to do a couple together? Or do you want to work uh, independently? Together. Yeah. Okay. So let's um, let's walk through a little bit. Uh, what's our first test? We look at the data and we step back and we say, hmm. does it feel mound-like? Sam, what do you mound-ish? Ish, Tony? We got a little missing tooth in the middle there. Um, very moundish. Remember, statisticians are speaking trend-like. This is very moundish. Look how moundish. How much more moundish do you want out of real data? So we're quite happy. And, and how can we prove it? Question six, six asks, using the histogram and summary statistics, well, what two values do we compare? We want to look at our two centers. What's our mean? Material movers mean across 50 states is... Let's, uh, let's round to the nearest dollar, shall we? Uh, 23,639. So our mean is 23,639. We want to compare that to... Okay. Compare mean to... forty three. Yep, which is your what? Exactly. Thank you. And how close are those? Using my little ugly, ugly numbers. That's really close, statistically speaking. Uh, within 200, 200, but a little over 200. So we'd say uh, very close in quotation marks. Um, or in other words, normal enough to keep going normal 
enough. Now remember on the test you will be told you won't ever have to make the determination. On the final they'll say, assume it's normally distributed. Um, and that's what you're going to do moving forward. Um, so I, I'm pretty happy with that uh, to keep going. Uh, any readers for seven and new readers? Avery, Dejanelle, Rachel, Brenna, readers? I don't want to make people read, but I don't want to read. I'm going to take a break. Did you read, Rachel? Yes. Thanks. Based on census data about material moving occupations, imagine you meet Lester who moves materials for a living in one of the U.S. states. Lester reports his annual income to be $25,348. What is his standard score? Interpret it in a sentence. Good. Go. Standard score is the same as? Z-score. Z-score. Good. Two minutes on that. You should be able to go quick. This might be a good time to uh, go back to your homework. Remember our z-score is data value minus mean over standard deviation. So it gives us some number of Standard deviations. Do you want us to use the rounded one we did for the question six? The for the, the mean. Um, or do you want us? I to wouldn't mean? round the mean. Okay. I would just round the value okay. if I if I gave you a weird number. gives us some number of standard deviations above or below the mean. Nominations for Z? Avery, do you have a Z? I got 1.021. Any seconds? Second. Yeah. I agree. I agree. So we got a Z of 1.02. We'll round to two decimal places. So um, let, now we're ready for question eight. I want to keep us moving because we only have 12 minutes left. Uh, look, draw diagrams to show your thinking. Compute what percent of U.S. states we'd expect to have a median income for material movers. This is our nor This is the less than or equal to means we don't have to do the conversion. What this, what the table tells us, is our answer. If it was above, we'd have to switch it, which is of course question number nine. Okay, so let's draw our picture. Draw a pretty little picture. What's going to be in our picture? It's going to be our distribution. That's always going to look the same because this class is only about normal distributions. We may label us our center. Center is our nice mean. Center was $23,639.17.3. So X bar 23,639. And Lester. So this is our Z of zero, and then we have our one, so here's Lester, Lester of Z of 